So basically, um, I chatted last year about drones a fair bit. Um, this year, I've actually put my money where my mouth is and thrown a few bucks down on the table to have a crack at it. So um, basically today, I'm just going to talk about taking these data layers. So you're going to see all these pretty pictures. Um, yeah, basically, I'm one of the guys who's had a crack at it, got one of these water schemes in and thrown a few million down and um, putting my money where my mouth is. So basically, it's all about the data sandwich. Um, you're going to get bombarded with maps, graphs, overlays, sexy pictures, things that just make you go, wow, um, what can you actually do to make money out of it? And from a grower's perspective, when you're going into irrigation expansion or re-optimisation or in some cases reinvigoration, um, what things are actually giving you bang for your buck and how does it go? So I got one of these once in a generation chances to take water to the back of the farm. Uh, we literally just got the pipe turned on and they announced another once in a generation, although the Politicians now left, um, so yeah, just stack them on, eh? <laughs> it's only money, the interest rates are cheap. Um, so basically, um, New Southern Highlands Irrigation Scheme, um, S-H-I-S, not T. So it, options were there for spur lines. Uh, we already had irrigation at, at our main homestead. Um, drain marshland was a site that I had in mind, the other end of the farm, nine and a half k's away. Just uneconomical, almost stupid to try and push Clyde water up over the hill because I had to actually basically do a 300 metre lift to get it up to roll down to the other side. Uh, it's isolated, no power, the fences were crap, no trees. So it was a pretty good site. So here's old Google Earth. Um, so here's the Thorpe homestead down here with some irrigation, some linears and the mighty Clyde River that causes wars. Uh, bit of bush and this, this, what we call the square, this back basin of the farm. So I was interested, it's nine, nine or 10 k's that back corner, and I was interested in converting dry land instead of land at Thorpe that had been irrigated for about 140 years. So I had to do something to make a bit of money that would justify this expense. So the square was the chosen site, it's a, it's a 2013 image. So we've been doing a bit of dry land, uh, roll the dice style cropping down there. See the green, a few wet spots. This is the marshland, salt pans. Um, challenging site but some nice soils so getting in there the foundation data was the first step understanding the variability uh, being an overeducated know-it-all coming back from uni with a love of data and science uh, did cause some tension and I didn't know a thing about farming and all this mumbo jumbo but um, I was pretty passionate to understand it with data and put numbers and lines around it so one thing about farmers is you're all good at knowing you've got a problem all precision ag is doing is drawing a really accurate line around the problem you know you've already got so it's nothing new, we're just putting a line around it. Um, and in generational businesses, I can tell you it's an exciting thing to do, to draw lines around it and figure it all out. So I went for EM38 because I had salinity. I did the drone digital elevation model, PMPH grid testing. I did soil type mapping and test pits. So I did that with Luke. We drove around, we got the shovel out, we felt soils, we wetted them up, made ribbons. Uh, then I went and drew on Google Earth with my own knowledge my own soil types and gave them classifications just to help build up a database of what was out in that basin and what I could potentially do. Uh, I also did a bedrock surface model which was a new UAV tech we developed which measures um, the actual bedrock surface. So I was looking for reefs and sandstone layers and sandstone interaction which brings water out of perched water tables um, and strategic and um, broad basic uh, soil sampling which I did with Luke. So we did transects through zones that we knew were different and challenging, trying to build up a picture. So the M38 data, the blue's salty as hell. Funnily enough, it's the waterlogged spots, the marsh, you can see it there. So that was bulrushes and reeds up over a massy, little massy Ferguson 28 in the 50s and over climate change and things and drains, it's drained. So we also looked at the lime, we had variation, um, purple not needing much you know, greens, two ton, three ton there. Some stuff needed a good old top up. Phosphate was the same. Uh, paddock history played a huge role. Uh, then you get into the flats, the topography played a little bit. All sorts of stuff you can't eyeball, you know. And we're talking, that's a 260 hectare investigation site. So they weren't cheap tests, but they were worth throwing it down. The drone map uh, basically was a high resolution image. I have water holes everywhere to miss. And some of these are dug 40 metres deep through the bedrock um, to try and get uh, artesian water to come up so we could survive the last big dry spell. 
and we also had swamps, springs, all sorts of stuff. A 160 year old dog kennel that we can't remove, but we can straddle, all this sort of stuff. So creating a plan from the data. So basically waterlogging modelling was a big one because it was a swamp. Uh, variable rate P application, the variable rate lime application, uh, accurate pivot layout where we can put it to miss that dog kennel and a few other things. Um, and doing this digital surface flow analysis to work out where the water will go and if we can get rid of it. So basically drainage was the big one. So anywhere that's white is where water is going to accumulate and flow very slowly. So funnily enough, the marsh, it's flat, 35 centimetres of fall across a kilometre. Some of it gets wet. Reds, low areas, greens, high areas. So basically, no matter what I did there, if I drew little circles here and lots of pipes and 40 hectare pivots, 20 hectare pivots and towed and whatever, no matter what I was stuffed, I was going to get wet. So it's a matter of how much, where do I put my money now? So the final plan was a big pivot. Let's just go for it. Let's have a crack. Try and beat Andrew McShane and Frankie Fish. Who, <laughs> that was the goal. Uh, no, I went and talked to them a lot. But basically, yeah, pivot centre here by the road and just go boundary to boundary. Just fill her up with one big pivot. Try and bring down the capital cost. And the squiggly lines you see are all drains. And the idea was drain the landscape and then do surface drains. That's what I could afford. So from this pivot centre through the swamp, we dug a grade, a grade controlled drain. And then we went another three kilometres down through the neighbours to get it out of the water catchment. So the first step was drain the site, except they've got to put a big pivot on it and have a go. So basically, what all this data sandwich allowed me to do was run some economics on how much ground I could irrigate, run some risk profiles on what was going on, confidently know what my flood risk was. So even if I had three good pivots out of four, I still had one really crap pivot that I probably wasn't going to make my cash flow and repayments on. So, you know, it's all there. Quantify and model the benefits, like just modelling what the hell could go on. It's worth its weight in gold. So in the end, I went for a 942 metre pivot. I missed out on beating Frankie and Andrew. Um, it swings 202 degrees, gets about 160 hectares under it, and has a 1.7 mil pack, which I stood at one of these events and I was told can, can never work, but I can tell you it does. Uh, so effectively, because it's 200 degrees, it's about 3 mil in 24 hours across the entire site. Uh, everyone says big pivots are bad, in high instantaneous application rate at the end of the pivot. It's actually not that bad. It's only walking 3.2 k's, whereas like a 500 or 480 metre pivot is trying to walk 5 k's in 24 hours. So I'm walking 2.5 k's less, so it's less water infiltration. It's actually better than you'd think. It's a big head bender, that one. Um, the outside six bands, I chucked on three wheels at huge cost. It's 20 k's of less wheel ruts. Like it all starts adding up. When you don't think about little pivots and how many kilometres of wheel ruts are inside little pivots, there's a bloody lot but you can't tow a three wheel pivot. Um, the big drainage works was my big investment on it. Uh, I wanted full remote control, variable speed drive on the pumps because of the change in elevation and the high cost of the water. And I wanted to keep it simple, stupid. I just wanted a simple four wedges, very simple rotation, grow opium and grow red meat. That was the goal, run it remotely from anywhere and be able to bring consultants in to help run it. So that was the goal and we went for it. Um, so that's the project beginning, that's 80 hectares started up, all into poppies, year one, drainage chucked in. So it showed that I was going to flood, yep, that's how much ground I'm juggling here, that's the gamble, that's what I had to convince the bank manager around. How do I manage it? Drains, Gibbo hopefully will come cut some stuff for me later once I get some cash flow back, but to start it's just surface drains. So this is a high resolution drone data. Um, there's a drain there that we're looking at in purple, and here's the slope on it. So all we're doing is cutting surface drains. I'm drawing in a line, putting it in my auto steer, marking it with a grader, and then bringing in a big dump scraper. Cheap as butter to work, but if you're going to cut surface drains, don't try and cast the dirt out and spread it and spread it and spread it. You just make a barrier and actually create your drain 10 metres away or 20 metres away where you cast it. Use a scraper, pick it up, take it away, put it somewhere else, and don't try and fill hollows. That never works. Uh, put it on the side of a bank or somewhere else. But uh, those things are one of the best things to cut a drain. So there's the big, well, what I call the mega drain. It's a one kilometre drain. It's only got 40 centimetres fall on it. And it's right through the middle of the site to take all the water away. All dug on RTK and then continues out three k's. 
Positioning of the pivot was another big thing with 18 spans to deal with. They have water holes everywhere. Where the hell to sit it all, where it'll fit. And actually getting it to straddle the cliff around here, we gained another 18 hectares. We could bring it around from 175 degrees to sort of 202. So planning, thinking ahead, and just modelling so we know how much TI water to buy and what we could potentially grow. This is a good example, which won me a bag of donuts with the builders. It was going to straddle the water hole at the black lines of where I said the wheels were going to go. And uh, that's where she went. So this, this degree of planning is so helpful when you're doing these schemes because they're big bucks, you know, 1200 bucks a meg, I bought 500. That's three quarters of a million just there. So a half million dollar pivot. It all adds up. Like it all starts getting damn terrifying and you've got your backside hanging out. Um, so the other thing I did was add VRI to the pivot. Um, again, it was basically $100,000 to put it onto the full pivot. Instead I stepped it back, uh, span six I started. Because I'd modelled those inner spans, I knew surface drainage was going to control the bulk of the problems that I had. VRI for an extra you know, 40,000 bucks wasn't going to add much. So I put it on the outside. And what really I was doing was controlling the soil type, uh, water holding capacity and surface flow. So where water's going to pull, and as a result, cuts down your wheel ruts. Um, 4.2 megs a day is my flow rate into the machine, it's maximum flow. And with VRI, it's only running at about 3.8. So I'm actually gaining sort of 0.6 of a meg a day, which over 140 day of delivery or 120 day of take, I can actually stretch myself out and give myself another six or seven days. And with these low volume pivots, it's kind of worth its weight in gold to keep the thing moving. The idea is never to let it stop. So reds are where we crank the water on, greens are where we cut it back. So wet patches, there's that lake. Um, again, finally we executed the data. So it just allows you to plan, position the machine, know where your risks are, project managing, putting this, putting this system up. Like I had people and gear going everywhere and I marked all my fences out in GPS you, know, you can just draw a line in the ground and your, your farm hand goes there and whacks the strainers in, drags the fence up, puts the electric fence in. You don't have to go and eyeball and do everything else. Same with the drains for the scraper driver. He's going flat out. Your spreader guy's going flat out. It really, really helps reduce your stress. Um, and I'm glad I did. I put the drains in and it was dry. And then in December, we got that huge rain. Uh, we've got 120 mil in one night. Um, so she filled up with water pretty much Right where we told it, there's that section there, and uh, there it is there, full of water. Knew it was going to get wet, knew it was risky, uh, but that's just part of the game when you roll the dice on these things, and that's in crop. So, knew it would come. If I hadn't done all this, I would have been buggered. I wouldn't have made more repayments, but I got pizzled. I got a very low assay and low yield. The crop got stressed, but I'm making my repayments. I covered my cost of production, and I had the data once this happened, to then pull back all my inputs. So I cut the water off where it was buggered, put the third in where it counted, cut my spray program back and bought my cost of production per hectare right down on where it counted. And it really helped me make my, make my bills pay. So my key messages are there's a hell of a lot of fruit out there. Um, pick your apples, pick your coconuts, get what you want to get out of it. And um, precision ag's sexy as hell and there's a lot of things to get you hyped, but you need to pick ROI. Bang for your buck, and for me, it's whole farm planning in greenfield sites, variable rate for it pays, uh, basically your drainage pays, big dividends, and uh, plan for the worst case, and uh, when it happens, there's no nasty surprises. When I had that big rain, I got up, and everything was wet that I thought was going to be wet, and uh, you know, I wasn't too panicked. So thanks very much for your time, and last of all, bring pros in to help you. Thanks.